You've seen how we can use the at state property wrapper to make data that's local to the current view and mutable. We've also used at observed object and at state object to create data that can be shared with other views as an external object. Or the third kind called at environment object that takes a concept of sharing data one level further. We can place an object into the environment so any child view can use it and have access to it and have updates from it as well. Now imagine that we had multiple views in our program, all sort of lined up, going deeper and deeper in the navigation stack, for example. Uh, view A shows view B. View B shows view C. View uh, C shows D and D shows E, for example. Now, if we had an object in A that had to be used by E with at observed object, a would pass to B, B would pass to C, C would pass to D, and D would pass to E. That's what it would do. It'd make a little chain of content going down the line. And that's very annoying, particularly if, if uh, B, C, and D don't actually use the object. That is basically passing along the daisy chain to the next thing at the very, very end. With environment objects, we have a much better solution. We can put the object into the environment in A. Here you go. And B can have it or ignore it. C can have it or ignore it, D can have it or ignore it, and when E wants to have it, it can also have it and go ahead and modify it. So it was there for all the views, but only the ones that actually ask for access get it. It's there waiting for them if they want it. So it's a much nicer way of sharing data in more complex apps. Now, there's one last thing I should mention before I show you some code. Environment objects use the same observable object protocol you've already seen with your classes. And so you can go ahead and make them at published various properties, and they'll announce changes to SwiftUI views really, really nicely. Okay, let's look at some code. We'll say uh, we're going to share some data between two views. We'll say there is a new at main actor class called user, which conforms to observable object. And inside there we'll have one property at published var name is Taylor Swift. As you can see, I'm using the at main actor attribute here plus observable object and at published, just like we've used previously. All that knowledge you've built up is really starting to pay off. Next, we're gonna define two SwiftUI views that use our new user class. These will use the environment object property wrapper to say the value of this data comes from the environment rather than being made locally. So we'll say we have a struct called edit view, which is a view as at environment object via user is a user and then var body some view text field name text is user dot name so that's our editing view we we'll have another view down here called display view also a view again at environment object via user is a user and var body some view has text user.name. So one for editing, one for just reading back. Now this property wrapper at environment object use both, both these views. This will automatically look for a user instance in the environment and place whatever it finds in there into this property user. If it cannot find a user in the environment, if there is no user instance in there, your app will just crash. It's a logic error, a program error, not to have the right thing in the environment. If you say it's there, it must be there. Notice how, by the way, neither this view or this view actually create the user. No one's saying var user equals uh, a new user. We're not saying that. We're just saying there will be a user in the environment already. Please let me read it. And now in our content view here, we can go ahead and make a user instance. I'll say at state object, private var, user equals user. And then in our body, as a vstack with edit view, environment object, that user. And display view, environment object, that user. And that's what it takes to get our code up and running. Uh, we've said make an edit view, add a display view, and put the environment object of our user into both those places. So you can see 
Taylor Swift's right there in both these places. They're, they're combined, they share the same object. And if I were to go ahead and edit our text, you would see both change at the same time. So let's say Adele Atkins, for example. They both update at the same time. Now, here's the clever part. We can rewrite this code to remove the environment object from here and from here and put it onto our VStack like this. And what you'll find is our code works identically. The exact same thing happens like that. Because the user is in the environment for the VStack and the VStack owns the edit view and display view. And so injecting it here makes it available everywhere to all child views of the VStack here. So it inherits the environment from its parent automatically. Now, in this case, we are literally explicitly saying, make me this user instance, and then paste it into the environment. Off you go, inject to the environment we shared here uh, for edit view and display view. I'll be tempted to say, don't make it private. It's sending the wrong signal. This thing isn't private. It really is being shared elsewhere. Now, you might wonder how environment object actually works. How does it make a connection between uh, environment object, this user, and up here at environment object user? How does it know to place this object into here? While you've seen previously how dictionaries let us use one type for the key and one type for the value, and the environment effectively lets us use data types for the keys, and instances of that type as the value. This is a bit mind bending at first, but imagine it like this. The keys are things like int, string, bool, user, whatever, with the values being five, hello, true, that user right there. And so when we say, give me the int from the environment, we'll get back five. Give me the user from the environment, we'll get back this user we created right 